This is all content. This is crucial, man. Uh, well, let me start off. Uh, Lee Joe, yes, thanks sir. for coming on my show, man. This is my first actual taping of the Catch Me Outside protest podcast. And uh, I appreciate you coming out, man. It's kind of fitting that you're my first guest because I met you at Eamon's Warehouse gig. Yeah. The first one I went to. Uh-huh. You know, so I started talking with you there, and a lot's been going on in those couple months. Um, so that's cool, man. I'm glad that we're kind of making a full circle here. At least yeah. our relationship. Come, come back and say howdy. Yeah. Now, now we show up at every protest, and <laughs> hey, how's it going? <laughs> Well, what do you think about all these protests, man? I mean, what's, what's your take on that? Yeah, they're great, except we should have had one this weekend, too. And instead of building energy, we're just settling for status quo because the governor's opening something or something. I, we're, we're, we're losing the energy. Yeah. You know. That's, that, that's really what kind of planted my seed to do, make this show happen. As I felt like, okay, we're getting all this energy built up in the protests here at the Capitol. But what's going to happen when Governor Little and his, you know, uh, Jepson cohort bureaucrats, when they start to pull it back? He, what's that line from uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail? If I went around claiming I was emperor just because some Dave Jepson had signed an order for me... You know, supreme executive power lies in a mandate from the masses, not from some farcical pen ceremony where they decide they're going to be the uh, supreme dictators of all of us. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is what? So what I was saying is like, look, we're, they're pulling back the, the, the lockdown, right? We're going through these phases. And my concern is that people are just going to think, yeah. oh, gosh, oh, I'm so bad. glad it's yeah, over. Exactly. You know, and, and I think there's some human nature in that, right? So you get through a traumatic moment. And, and then once the trauma stops, you, you, you'll, you can you look some, back at it and say, oh, that was bad. Right? Some people bad will even block better. it out entirely. Yeah. You know, if it's intense trauma, you yeah. know, people will totally block it out as a mechanism to kind of go through the future without having angst yeah well that's part of what we got going here you know there's uh there is an actual petition movement you know real legal registered with the secretary of state petition movement that started on facebook right now and uh you know they were going to do some petition training and uh you know the and people got scared and won't even have the won't even let the petition training happen so when you're that scared of your government and you are we the people, what is wrong? Okay, so I, that protest, you know, the, I took down fence down there, Rhodes Park, and, you know, the cops stopped us and kind of pointed out that we were thieving, and, but, you know, the intent was to put it back up on city property around City Hall where it properly belongs so we can contain that bunch of communists. But, um, but we... We get this, and then look at what just happened up at that brewery that the lieutenant governor helped open, you know, was there for. Yeah. You know, 18, yeah. 18 cops show up. Is that hardware? Yeah, hardware, hardware brewing. brewing. Yeah. yeah. Um, 18 cops show up, and some <laughs> judge has taken and signed an order, you know, a, 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 for a search warrant on the place for mm. from this date forward and they took the whole thing yeah you know and you know who sent them up there to do what oh that's right brad little right and so when you look at what brad's doing with the legislature and what he's doing right now with this you know smile while i send my uh, troops in yeah. to your place of business um what what i'm seeing is that brad tells the legislature what to pass and what not to pass. And then the legislature passes or doesn't pass what he says. So when you're at that point, do you have a a governor and a legislature? Or do you have Khrushchev and the Politburo? Okay, what are we puppeting and why? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Brad Little was the... uh, President of IACI, that's the Association, uh, the Idaho Association of Commerce and Industry, and that is the biggest businesses in Idaho. And that's all the, you know, the Simplots and the Albertsons and the, you know, and the big banks and all those 
you know, and big farm, oh, especially big farm and big dairy, you mm -hmm. know, and the sugar growers and all these giant corporations, um, you know, they, they have all the money. He was their president and he does their bidding and, and, and what happens is they decide they're going to tilt the field for whatever purpose they have. Yeah. And, you know, on this one, it's, we might as well crush small business while we're using this COVID thing. Yeah. So, so what got exempted? Did, did uh, any of the sugar growers or the dairies or the, or anybody like that uh, become a, a uh, what is it? A non non essential. Non -essential? Yeah. You know, third class citizen. Did any of them become a third class citizen? No. 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 Those are Brad's buddies. Yeah. That's his. That's his. You know, Brad's the heir to, uh, I believe, the second largest ranch in Idaho. Mm. And you know, it comes from a long line of cattle ranching history. Yeah. And well, sheep ranching originally. But you just start looking at him. You look at his stands and you think, well, that's a big business Republican. Yay for business. Then you look closer and it's business is just taking the government and the govern and, and this and the whole legislative system and doing their bidding. Yeah. And I am 100 percent a small business competitive industry. No. Republican. There's, well, isn't that called fascism? That, or that corporatism when you start well, to have at a, a minimum it's corporatism. corporatism and when you do send Idaho State Police yeah. to a place of business to raid the business and exceed their warrant mm -hmm. and most likely you've had a sympathetic judge sign the warrant I think that's what we're looking at yeah. there's you know remember all the all the great dictators in history, you know, they've talked and kept the people happy. And some majority of the people have said, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Well, he's Brad. I voted for him and he's a Republican, so he must be all right. Yeah. But always judge somebody on their actions. For sure. You know, that that was another reason why I wanted to get something like this going. You know, my, my vision here is is we're having these conversations at the park. My vision is at some point we have a hundred people around us and we're having conversations about liberty and about the uh, the dynamics uh, of the relationships between government, between business, where, you know, between citizens, you know, um, because I feel like the shutdown was only possible because so many people were willing to go along with it. You know, and it's like we have I want to do something to change or to to wake up people because it's not enough for us to plead to Brad and his and his cohorts. Right. We have to somehow get the masses to awaken to the uh, tyranny, it, you know, to 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 the um, to, to their rights being violated, it, you know, because if we don't if we don't get the public on board with us. They're going to be able to keep on, uh, on doing these things. And that's exactly where we're at. I mean, we had 1,500 people at the first rally, maybe 1,700 at the second rally, and we had them on weekends, on sunny days after a long winter. Yeah. And everybody, as long as it doesn't affect them, they'll just go on about their business. And yeah. So we've got. So yeah, we had these rallies. You know, we were building some momentum. We may still yet. And they're, like I say, there are continuing actions going on here. Yeah. But those, uh, you know, and I don't think anybody in Idaho is going to forget Brad Little on this. You know, there's and there's still people out there saying Brad did the right thing. We had, we had uh, the herd man mentality happen. You yeah. know, everybody says the sheep, the sheeple, or whatever. Okay, the herd saw COVID-19 and said, oh crap let's stampede and they took off yeah. and they said where's who's going to take care of me and they said well brad little will mm -hmm. you know and so the we, rancher we had <laughs> and here's here's the other little secret that you ought to throw into your put under your cap is that covid at coronavirus is actually a disease in cattle which is extremely deadly 
and very contagious, especially young cows will die overnight like that, drowned in their own snot, mm. okay? And so if he's got that going through his mind, especially at the beginning of this, mm. with his, med you know, this is my, my justification for, you know, illegal activity, sure. sort of in his mind. Sure. But so when, it, you know, they can lose whole herds in a hurry mm -hmm. over coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we don't stand around and lick each other like a cow does. Right. Okay. We, we're not cows. No. As a matter of fact, we're sentient humans with uh, freedom and ability to choose what's safe for us and what to do. Mm -hmm. And you saw for two weeks, mm -hmm. For two weeks, everybody saw coronavirus coming. Yeah. And and they said, okay, well, no church, no, et cetera, voluntarily right. and spread out and just, you know, and businesses were already taking a huge hit. Travel industry was taking a huge hit. Right. Okay. The free market was compensating for, you know, a deadly disease coming down the, down the pipe. And then Brad just pulls this crap out of his hat, out of uh, martial law, section 46, Idaho Code, and says, you know, I think you guys don't know what's good for you, and I'm going to tell you what's good for you, and I'm going to deprive people of property rights and the right to do business and what have you, with no no justification. Yeah. I mean, really no justification. Yeah. Isn't that what the government does so often, though? They, they see which way the market's moving in, and then they try to jump in in front of it and be the hero. Market interference is what government is actually best at. Mm. You know, they uh, and when they interfere with it, there's always a huge ripple effect. You know, I believe in the free market like no other. We can, like, like we said, we've had this, we had this lick. Yeah. So the governor gives his order, yeah. and two days later, we were at the top of the of the curve in Idaho. Yeah. Two days. Did, was that because Brad Little said everybody stay at home? No, it's because for two weeks we've been practicing and starting practice. Right. And there were some outliers. You know, a bar, bar was open and people would crowd together. Statistically, that's nothing. Nothing. Statistically, yeah. it's a big zero. Yeah. You know, and statistically insignificant. Sti sti so, yeah. you know, people people can still could still freely associate it. Look, I mean, we're st sitting here looking at Taiwan. Look at Sweden. Look at the look at South Dakota. OK, everybody, nobody changed anything with the stay at home orders. Mm -hmm. The only thing that made a difference was was spacing, you know, wash your hands. It's the same old hygiene. What now now you can't get get anybody to just say wash your hands and, and uh, don't touch your face and quit spitting on each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't even you can't even get that out of anybody. It's, it's, it's now it's you have to wear a mask and you have to do this and you have to do that and you have No, it's remember wash your hands. Yeah. And try not to spread something to somebody else yeah, yeah. And that's what personal responsibility is mm. okay i'm responsible for me and i'm responsible for not hurting you yeah. intentionally or wanting <clears throat> where did where did personal responsibility become something to you like when, when did that become an ideal or something to strive for in your life well i think we just got to go back to church where it actually started, you know, it started teaching me, well, in a church at age eight, they, they, they tell you, hey, you know, you're old enough to make your own decisions. You understand right from wrong when you turn eight. Mm. At about age seven, you're still just, what did mom say? What did dad say? But right. about age eight, there's yeah. a little clicker Clicks that goes on. off that says, okay, here's right and wrong. Yeah. So personal responsibility. And then, you know, and that's coincidentally when Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts starts mm -hmm. and they start teaching responsibility. Mm. You learn it, learn the notes, you know, mm. about uh, being a, a responsible young, young man. Right. And that's where it starts at. And that's where we've got to go with our with our kids in every generation is got to always remember start them young yeah teach responsibility yeah yeah now it's a crucial crucial thing to be to uh being a <clears throat> a um, respectful person you know it's crucial to being uh have, having self-responsibility uh is crucial to uh, being confident in yourself you know believing in yourself you know it, it really is the core to being an individual you know so when i see the government attacking personal responsibility with these mandates it it really it it, it makes me think um god what don't like 
Why are they trying to, to get in front of this when we already have institutions in place like church, the Boy Scouts, you know, all of these institutions that are promoting this idea well, uh, and for good reason, right? Because it's, it, it doesn't mean anything if you walk around with a mask because somebody told you to. It, it, you know, if you, don't, if you don't till your own soil, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean as much when that food grows than if you actually till it yourself. This, this, is really part of, this is really kind of the root of the problem. People don't know where their food comes from. People don't understand that it takes work, labor, effort, and sweat to grow food, to uh, process food. You know, we're looking, we're sitting in downtown Boise, and on my left-hand side is the greatest comp uh, com compilation of uh, liberals in the state. And they all went to public schools, got uh, college education, and got jobs where they can sit in offices and behind computers or whatever it is they do. Oh. And almost none of them understand how that food got to Winco. Yeah. You know, that there's a, a long line, there's, there's a long line of responsible people that made it to that point. And they don't appreciate the fact that they can sit in their, they can work from home or whatever it is they're doing at, right. at this moment. Right. And meanwhile, the uh, non-essential people are just destroyed. Destroyed? You know, their, their hairdresser, ah, yeah, the oh, yeah. second-class citizenry. No, it's beyond second class. Okay. When you do that to a, when you do that to people that are already struggling, do you think a hairdresser makes a flat penny at anything? No, no, no. they don't. It's struggling. They're struggling. Yeah, you know, and so you know, they, I mean, they have to move in. They have to a lot of times relocate in order to find places where it's not oversaturated. And they have to they have to build a clientele. Right. And and then once they're one of them that actually builds a clientele, maybe some point along the way. They'll move into a high-end salon, and maybe at some point they'll make sixty thousand dollars in a year on it if they're really busting their butt and they're in a high-end place. Yeah, and that's yeah. a tough job. And you Cause stand it, on your feet right. all day long. And, and you're being held to a high standard. I mean, you people absolutely. You know, people's you hair perfect. You have to. Yeah, I gotta look good. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I don't gotta look good. I know what I look like. It ain't gonna <laughs> get any better. Uh, yeah, it, it's that that crushing uh, of the small businesses. Um, it it's very concerning, it, it, you know. And I'm not sure exactly how much of the the st stimulus. Which I hate even saying that word because you know it's it seems more like a bribe. That's what I'm getting that to. That is what it was. You know, is it is it, it how much how effective is that check? And the uh, additional six hundred dollars a week that they're giving to people for for unemployment, how effective is that right now in suppressing this the, the outrage? Yes, that's, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we bought socialism by putting those those checks in place. We bought the people's pacification. Yeah, you know, by putting it didn't change that their rights were taken away. It right. changed their attitude about mm. their rights being taken mm. away. That's, that's a good point. They haven't, they didn't understand their rights to start out with. Right. So, you know, we've seen the memes, you know, there is, there's a dead raccoon on the side of the road and there's a balloon floating out of its hand. It's the stimulus check, but the raccoon's still dead. Yeah. You know, yeah. people don't realize it. What, I mean, I, my optimistic side says... Tell me the optimistic part. My man. optimistic side hopes that this whole economy treats this like the French economy treats August. Mm. They all shut down and go on vacation in August and there's no productivity in France. Yeah. And that's for a straight month. Right. Now, we had some productivity yeah. and we had a shutdown and maybe, this, maybe that stimulus money becomes just enough to float everybody through and make it a vacation. But... Well, when they return this in August, is, they return is, to a job, right? That's the whole problem. <laughs> right, right. So, so now we're returning to our to our place of businesses, and it's like, well, nobody's showing up. And how many how many uh, how many brick and mortar stores have played bankruptcy? In wow, life? man, they're gone. They're they're, okay. they're, they're all gone. You, all you got is online, and oh, guess what? Uh, you think online Iaki is one of the uh, mm. chief puppeteers for? Wow. Uh, for Brad Little, yeah. I'll bet you a whole bunch. But Iaki has a secret role of who's actually in Iaki, so we don't actually know that. Oh, really? 
hey, you can't find out who's in Nyaki because they're probably all too ashamed to be yeah. associated with them other than to say, you know, the, the Joe Candidate will come along and say, I was endorsed by Nyaki. Mm -hmm. Well, that just means you're bought and paid for and you're one of the worst puppets that ever list, you know, ever had yeah. Idaho blood in you. Yeah. So you think this is the shadow government? Uh, no, not a shadow government, just uh, just corporate self-interest, you know, no no real understanding that they'll actually make more money with competition. Oh, gosh. Competition breeds efficiency. It competition does. Competition always breeds efficiency. It does. So Instead the lazy it. one that says, I don't want any competition. So, so I don't want to get better. They want to, they want to be a giant, corp, fat corporate entity, right. you know, and, and they want to pay these, you know, their mid-levels and their whatevers, you know, their, and, and then they want to push all the rest into their own pockets but you know you know how much more money you'd make if you'd cut a few of those mid-level bureaucrats and expect more out of everybody else oh. just like the small businesses do right okay you'd be a heck of a lot more profitable you, but here's the thing man is i feel like your optimism just went your optimism was like very short -lived. that was my hope <laughs> Now here's what's here's what's really gonna happen. So we got optimism, we got realism, and then we got pessimism. Here's here's the pessimism. Side. Okay. So we're gonna go. Okay. So 42 percent of jobs of these jobs that we just lost, we're, and we're at 36 million. And well, I didn't. I, I'm guessing Tuesday will be 39 to 40 million unemployed in America. 40 million unemployed, total population of 350 million, mm -hmm. and our uh, uh, and uh, large majority of them, are, we got a, we got a big chunk of baby boomers retired on one end, and we got the under 18 on the other end, and that puts the workforce right here with 40 million people out of it. Well, how does that how how is that sustainable? You don't nobody nobody puts enough emphasis on this. The unemployment rate during the Great Depression was 26%. Uh, We're looking at a straight 30 right this minute. Mm. Okay, straight 30. And okay, if everybody goes back to work, I mean, if, if we can get some jobs back, there's no magic button that flips demand on, right? That is the problem. There is no demand button in a free market economy. Mm. Demand is built over time, mm -hmm. and it's n there is no demand button. Mm. So we're looking at probably 42 percent, 40 plus percent of those unemployed people not finding a job again for the next I don't know. And when you've got that large of an unemployment uh, factor, you've got that big of a destruction of the economy. That that lack of of uh, money in the economy and, and and turnaround, the rate of cash flow. Mm -hmm. You, it's a straight Great Depression. Yeah. Okay. And it's probably going to make the last Great Depression look similar. It's mm -hmm. going to look similar to it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we we already had flashes of it with the with the ag with you know with the agriculture problems, the the supply chain problems in agriculture that caused the bottlenecks at the beef plants where giant corporations, giant corporate meat packing plants owned by Brazil, stopped buying American meat shut down for COVID-19 and then decided they're going to use their Brazilian meat in the packing plant instead. Mm. So mm. it's, uh, you know, we've got these, we've got these major problems that are going to surface in depth once we did, once the, once, once the real unemployment rate settles out. Right. Because you can't, you once, can't do it. Once September 1st in the, in the France thing, once yeah. September 1st hits. <laughs> Then yep. it's like, oh, yep. oh, okay, uh -oh. where are we at? Yeah, here? Now where am I going? But, you know, but I'm getting my extra six hundred bucks. Yeah, and so I mean, so your your other side of this is you got six hundred bucks chasing no, no new goods and services. Right. Okay. So when six hundred bucks chases no new goods and services, inflation, inflation. Yeah, that's okay. what we're looking at. So we're looking at we're looking at print the money like it's going out of style. Yeah. The 35, the Weimar Republic, you can take a wheelbarrow of money, bring it to the bread store, and get you a whole loaf of bread. Yeah. So, I mean, hyperinflation. And then you can eat your bread next to the fireplace where you're burning all the, burning the other wheelbarrow money. of yeah. money. Yeah, but yeah. don't burn the wheelbarrow because it could be traded for something. <laughs> well, that's what we get into, right? We go, when we start slipping into that type of inflation, people's habits people's behavior starts to change dramatically right they just, you, you know, it no longer becomes what goods and services would entertain me and what pleasures can i have it 
purely survival mode and yeah. what am I gonna how am I gonna eat yeah yeah, yeah you want to you want to yeah. you want to make people hoard well that's how you get people to start hoarding oh, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah okay so we got we got optimist Lee Joe we got pessimist Lee Joe man you know and, and uh, what what out what else what how are you getting through this, man? Like, what what are you doing to Might wake be. up in the morning and, and 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 not just fall into depression? Or are you? I'm not, I'm not one of those people that's ever depressed. Mm. You know, and I I've you know I've I've, uh, I've dropped a couple businesses in my time. You know, lost them, worked my butt off, but lost them. Last time was guess what? The Great Recession. Mm. You know, and. Uh, through all that you you just decide that you're you're going on mm. and you're deciding that your family is more important than your emotions and whatever else you got going on. you just look at the kids and you say that's got to eat oh. and I'm gonna make it yeah and I'm gonna make it eat yeah and there's no there just isn't another option yeah but, well that's that's powerful man because you know a lot of the people who are like doing the trying to do the public shaming of you know people opening their businesses or even a lot of the governors and bureaucrats a lot of them don't even have kids well, and they're out here trying to tell us you know fathers and mothers it's the same old thing when the queen of france mm. was told she had that the, the peasants had no bread yeah she was so disconnected she said let them eat cake let them have their cake and she lost her head shortly after that yeah some people would say that there there is a group a hand in this that wants that war you know that is is push yeah that's the that's the other half you got the this, I had to google this myself a while ago there's this boogaloo group yeah that thinks that yeah let's start the revolution now yeah no do you value life right okay do you value the constitution yes okay so you've got to read the constitution you have to go to the methods that are given in the Constitution first and foremost. Right. You know, we have to we, we have to depend on our vote. We have to depend on you know, we need to get into the law, into right. the lawyers, into the not to the lawyers, there's that we need to get into the courts and persuade them that this was all a horrible, horrible overreach. And yeah. it's quite you know, it's obvious. Once once you've read the Constitution and the Idaho Constitution, that even Idaho Code Section 46 is unconstitutional. Mm. So, mm. we, so, uh, yeah. so, so those, so the, do you do you think that there are people who who want to push us to that, like civil war, t- or, or, or who are somehow thinking they're going to benefit from this uh, conflict if it goes on here? There are people on the right and people on the left, both. That are for uh, what you know for anarchy because mm. when anarchy breaks out, they think they'll come out on the other end with their their system in place. Mm. Oh, and, I see. You know, so I see. You know, it's it's what's going to happen in the middle. And so this is burn it down. Yeah, and then I'm going to build on the other it, side. Burn it down. <laughs> it's Bernie's the same way. You're burning. We need feel the a, burn. Feel the burn. We need a new. <laughs> we need a new system. Uh, you're just going to burn down the old system. Okay, and the other. And the other side, you know, our, our our brothers on the fire on the further right are going, you know, we need to burn it down because we need to get back to the Constitution. Mm. None of you get to burn it down. Yeah. This is we the people, and yeah. we're gonna have to get back to the words on the document. Yeah. Just read the words on the document. Yeah. I think it makes people feel really smart to say, let's burn it down. It yeah, makes them feel tough. It does. Empowered, it, it, or you know? to say that we need a new normal. I think I think it feeds into people's ego, like, oh, all that thousands of years of progress and building and and oh, redi- Western civilization yeah. was an accident. Yeah, let's just get it something new because I'm so smart and I just I know better. I got a better way to do it. Yeah, I got a better. You know, the, those founding fathers were, eh, you know, they weren't idiots. No, you know they, you know they had at least an eighth grade education, which at the time was a full on, <laughs> you know, was close to a, it was it was at least two years of junior college around sure. here. Sure. Yeah. You know, and so uh, and the, and the worst part was they they had experience with where their food comes from. Mm. You know, they understood that hard work, sweat, yeah. tears, 
when you translate it into money and then somebody else asks you for that money after all your work, mm. then maybe they want their money more than they want to give their money to somebody who just didn't work for it right. and is just asking for it. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And with the taxes. Tax. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. 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 Give so it up. Go Flip back here a few years. So when my business went to crap and uh, I was try, you know, trying to get something started here in Boise, I uh, dis uh, decided to run for uh, city council in 2009 and uh, at the same, about the same time the Tea Party uh, was, was coming together in Boise and uh, yeah, I went to the big Tea Party rally. We had 3,000 plus people out here. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and you can't, you can't, <laughs> yeah, we had 3,000 people out here. There's your little secret. And they all marched from uh, Albertsons Park up Main, or up the, up Capitol Boulevard to the, to the Capitol Wow. Staff. Twice as big, basically. Twice as big. Yeah. But none of them were scared of COVID-19. Right. You know, and yeah. that's part of, you know, that's part of what's happened with the, you know, the propaganda ran so far to the extreme of you're going to die if you're anywhere near this, yeah. that, that that's part of what's keeping people out of what we've got. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I remember you were at one of the meetings and you were telling people the differences between the, the, the masks, you know, the N95 and some other type of mask, and you were kind of give, giving people some ideas as to what's, what should be used. What, was there a time when you were afraid of the COVID, when, when you felt like it, your life was in jeopardy coming outside? Well, here's what happened before the COVID was discovered and everybody thought it was a thing, is that it was already here. Yeah. You know, um, there's no way on earth that something just happened in China <laughs> two months ago and and it's going to wait that long to come across. It's going to wait till the gonna, media it's, knows about it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to wait to jump on the 747 <laughs> until the until the media tells you. Okay, so the, two days after the first guy gets sick at the factory in China and 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 he's well let's say so he sneezes on his microchip that he's processing and it's cold winter over there mm. and then he bags it up so there's lots of moisture in it mm. then he uh, puts it out on the cold shipping dock where where viruses that are frozen actually do pretty good mm. and frozen in a little bit of spit yeah. you know helps or whatever sure. or snot, snot yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're they're pretty focused on okay i'm going to be alive for a little bit longer yeah. it goes two day air in the belly pan of a 747 you know fedex in itself into california or yeah. nevada or whatever yeah and the whole world two seconds later it's in a non-refrigerated or, or it's in a cold delivery truck it yeah. stayed cold from point to point it's been it's had refrigerated express the whole direction right cracks open and my brother opens up his bag uh, with the new microchip from wuhan china exactly i'm yeah. not joking oh wow and he takes this new microchip to put in his uh his game computer yeah drops it in and goes like this yeah and early january end of december my little brother, he's a machinist in Nevada, mm -hmm. got his whole company shut down for a week after he had it because nobody could come to work. They all had a fever of 105 yeah. plus. They were all coughing up their lungs. Yeah. And they all, and uh, my brother laid in bed, he has previous lung damage, mm -hmm. laid in bed in and out of consciousness for three days. Wow. So, but it got here whenever the government said it got yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, look at our cr crush the curve. The crush the curve is showing that w almost 2% of Idaho has already had it. But the official statistic still says 2,000 people have got it. Well, let's see, 2% of 1.8 million people, 36,000, mm -hmm. okay, 36,000 people have had it. That's what the antibody test is saying. Mm. The official statistic at the health department says like 2,500 people have had it. Wow. Okay. And then we're keeping track of COVID deaths. I've, <laughs> I've gone back to my, uh, you know, after I figured out my brother had it. And I heard his cough because I went down to the funeral not long after he had it. He was still recovering. Mm -hmm. But the COVID cough is a special cough. I'm telling you, it's a high lung dry cough. It's a horrible sounding thing. He's got, a, he's got his old lung damage cough. It's old pneumonia cough. But this was, 
this was great stuff. Mm. But uh, then I start I started asking people around, did you feel, you know, and I ran into 40 or 50 people at least who had it and some came close to death. Mm. None of the ones that I None of the major, none of the ones I'm talking about were really, really old. You know, nobody over 60 really, mm -hmm. except for some friends in Alaska. The whole family got it. They were all wiped out. The wife was pregnant for, uh, it was uh, eight and a half months pregnant, something like that, and she was this close to evacuating to the to the hospital in Bethel, and just just didn't. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you know you've seen blood oxygen levels on the floor like you do with COVID mm -hmm. but so she's so her aunt got it but her aunt was 90 so I, I was able to track one death before all this happened wow and that one was in Alaska mm. but the symptoms are not the flu mm -hmm. and I've asked them you, you know and I've talked to many of these people or the whatever literally I, ha I have talked to them and tried to eliminate you know the flu, eliminate a bad cold, eliminate uh, uh, strep, eliminate, and it comes down to this was here a long time before the government said it was here. Don't yeah. rely on the government for anything. If you want something done efficiently and if you yeah. want to know what's going on, figure it out yourself. You're mm -hmm. not gonna you're not gonna win with the mm -hmm. with the media and, yeah. and the government. You know, relying on them. Well, they it will come back to it, man. You got to figure it out for yourself, right? And and that's where it comes down to this personal responsibility. You know, think for yourself, figure it out for yourself. And when I, when I see all of this um, government interference in people trying to figure out things for themselves or trying to do things for themselves, the government comes in and mandates or propagates and, and gets the media to push all these things. So it makes it harder for people to do th think for themselves. Um, I, I just feel I feel like there's a war against the individual, you know, with 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 this. Like they don't like the part of the COVID thing and and, and the lockdown. I feel like it was um, t kind of distributing the pain, redistributing. It's like okay, we know this demographic, this older demographic is going to feel the pain, but we let. We are collectivists. This is what the government's saying. We are collectivists. We should all share. We pain. should all share it. Right, and so that's what I feel like. Like this was. This is like a collectivist exercise. That's what happens when we don't teach that personal responsibility. Right. The old person who's got the comorbidities, at, or or who is just extremely old, because really it's the extremely old that right. are, that are dying from this. Yeah. But it, the old person is responsible to keep themselves out of harm's way. We're responsible not to bring it to them. Mm. Okay. And so that's, we have to remember, individual responsibility is the responsibility of the individual. And we're going to do it because we do actually care about each other. Yes. I care if you get COVID-19. Yes. I do. And yes. I'm, I don't want to come down here with it and go, hey, right. uh, would you like a little bit of this? Right. You know? Right. So it's, you know, that the mentality of the government is that we're all down here trying to kiss each other. Or right. And illogical makes no sense and there's no way to react mm. when there's that logic in your head other than to say the government knows best and we're going to do this yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah i see i felt a lot of that of people accusing me of being uh uncaring you know and it, that's that's another reason why I wanted to get this show put together, right? And start to talk to just people like people who believe in liberty, man. Is because I was like, this narrative that that people who want liberty are somehow uncaring. Dude, that has to change. I mean, and it it it, it, it seems strange to me that that's even a narrative because if you ask me why I'm a libertarian, right? It's, it's say, well, because I believe that I have the same exact rights as other people. In fact, I look at other people in order to understand my own rights. I look at you and I say, well, what's his rights? Right? Because I'm going to respect his rights. And when I'm able to determine what his rights are, I'm going to know that that's the reflection of my own rights. Right. So, so that what you're, what you're indicating is that you share what I share, and that is radical equality. Mm. Okay. There is no way on earth that you have another right more than I have. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm sure of that. Mm. Okay, you have no right over me. Mm. I have no right over you. Mm -hmm. And the guy walking down the street, no matter what his status in life, you know, if it's the homeless bum, or if it's the governor himself, that dude is equal to me. Yeah. There's no difference. Mm. God looks at us all the same way. I try to look at us all the same way, and I say, that person has value. What can I do for them? And how am I going to make their life easier after my life's taken care of? Mm. You know, to for what I need. Mm. You know, what can I do to make the governor's life easier? Well, at this point, not a whole lot. He's cho you make choices, you have consequences. You know, what can I do to make the homeless guy's life a little easier? Well, I gave to the rescue mission, you know, two days ago, and it, and that goes back to another personal responsibility. I actually have a personal responsibility for those around me. I can't pass that personal responsibility off to another person, nor can I pass it, pass it off to another organization. That includes my church. That includes my government. Mm. It's my responsibility first to be responsible to help other people. Mm. But some people, a lot of people, most people, maybe all people think that if I tell the government to take care of someone else for me, then that means I'm my brother's keeper. Mm. Not true. No. That means you're a lobbyist. I'm a lobbyist. <laughs> I'm a lobbyist. And furthermore, I support I support the theft of this person's money to take care of that person as long as I only have to give a little bit. Yeah. You know? So call me radical or whatever, but take care of you. I like that. Once you're taken care of, yeah. then it's your responsibility to try and take care of somebody else. Sure. So do your part on a personal level. You know, when somebody comes to you in need, do what you can to figure it out. Take and and that's the thing. So when people, when they're taking away our rights like this, it's like, well, see, no, I'm not trying to jeopardize or I'm not being callous and just trying out here. What I'm trying to do is be responsible for my rights. Because first and foremost, I have to be responsible for me. And if the government is coming at me with these mandates and is taking away my rights, it, it is my duty as a man. To, to stand up against that because if I don't stand up against this now, how am I going to help anybody on the other side of this? It goes back to radical, <clears throat> radical individuality. And so I have a responsibility to my fellow man. My government only has that responsibility if I give that to them. Mm. If I've decided not to give that to them, then they don't have that responsibility. Okay? And in the Constitution, we never gave that to the government. Right. We never gave the, the welfare system until we decided to put it into law yeah. that you know, we, I give up my responsibility to take care of my, my grandparents you know, through Social Security. I, I give up my responsibility mm. to take care of, mm. of, of the homeless guy on the street. Mm. I'm going to let government programs do that. None of that's in the Constitution. Mm. You know, people decided to give up that responsibility, yeah. and now we're where we're at, where people expect it. Yeah. Now that now, and which means now you're expected to pay your tax and expected to uh, help fund Social Security, and you're expected to do all those things that were never in the Constitution. That were actually, if you were a responsible person in the mm. first place, mm. and if you belong to a responsible church in the first place things that we as a society would have taken care of on our own, but now we've given that right and that responsibility to the government, which we originally had for ourselves. Yeah. So uh, exercising your right, you have a right to take care of your elders. Exercising your right, you know, and then, and not exercising that right means you lose it. So, so we've lost it. Yeah. So here we sit. Yeah. You and I are talking about revolution and we got, you know, we got a whole society dependent on the government. I know, I know, man. That's that's why I was like, you know, this rallying. And what happened was, is the last time the rally was here, I was over here doing that painting, right? And I wasn't in the midst of it. And I started to actually have conversations with people who didn't agree with me, 
right? And, and, and that was great because when you're in the when you're in the crowd, everybody agrees and everybody's giving each other high fives, and you're not challenged. All right. So then, on I was sitting over here, a couple of people came by and they started to challenge me on, on my ideas, and that's I said, this, and I said, this is where I need to be. I need to be on the border exactly. of of the rally, Inter interacting with everyone else. We've we've already got we've already what are they, we've we're already preaching to the right to the converted over here and, yeah you know this video is going to go to the converted you know yes there's, there's going to be very few out there that say ah i wonder what lee joe thinks today right because first off nobody cares about lee joe sure. remember lee joe is nobody uh, just like everybody i am exactly the same as the next guy nothing special period yeah. so you know so we we sit here we preach to the crowd but when we when we get down to nuts and bolts we need to work on the individual relationship we have with our neighbor right we need to work on the individual relationship with the person walking down the street right. you need to say hi you need to smile and you need to start a conversation wow and you need to not be afraid of politics mm. in that conversation mm. and you need to have uh, a logical and complete thought in your head about why you believe what you believe mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you don't get to say a word about it until it really comes up what do you believe after you've heard of everything every somebody somebody else believes mm -hmm. and you, you hear you hear them first and then they become more willing to talk to you mm -hmm. and, and hear you wow. so yeah. ah. All right, Legio, we're coming up on 45 minutes here, and I don't want to keep you too long, man. It's plenty long for a YouTube video. <laughs> is there is there anything that you that you want to talk about? Uh, you know, I I can talk forever. Yeah, and it's probably not a good idea. Okay, well let's you know, let's like let's say, circle I'm, back to this then. I'm man. just one guy. Yeah, and I'm talking to a bunch of individuals, mm. and this is not a crowd of the true believers or whatever. It's somebody with their own rational mind and their own ability to think and their own God-given agency and uh, this has been the choice uh, you know throughout time how much how much liberty do you want how much security do you want I want all the liberty you I want all of it what are your, what are your <laughs> choices and, and then I'm not really worried about the security thing understanding how your liberty makes your security so much better yes you can't ask the government for security. No, no, man. This, Brad, Brad Little and, and the health department have decided they they have uh, authority over death now. Mm. That's that's the case. Mm. You know, I they they think that uh, when they make this mandate, yeah. that now nobody will die. Mm. That's insane. That's, that's what the government has assumed now. Yeah, okay. yeah. We're still going to die. Yeah, now yeah. we are. Well, I don't have a crosswalk to cross right now, but I'm about to get in a vehicle that does 65 miles an hour. Man, we it's risk our lives deadly, so much. Deadly, deadly stuff the, right there. It really is. And we risk our lives so much every day, which is why it's astounding and confusing to see a, a virus, you know, that could pre potentially present you with death change you or change people so much. It's like, you do, you, you are flirting with that every day. Yeah. We we looked at this when it started, and and the government and everybody was telling us that this was going to have a death rate, not as high as smallpox, but uh, close to it. Smallpox has a 20 to 30 percent death rate. Okay, and we're looking, and originally we thought this might be a six percent death rate. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty major death rate, and that puts it way way up there. Mm -hmm. But now we know. Okay, and like I said, when this first started. I started looking back. Mm -hmm. There's no way it stayed in China for three months. Yeah. Are you Jack kidding me? I know. Uh, so, I started looking back. Yeah, it's been here. Yeah. And yeah, we've had it. Yeah. And, and and now you look at, you know, what was the rational path? Well, we were scared. The the the, the crowd stampeded, and now we have to react to figure out how to get the herd back. Mm. You know, put put them, you know, mm. put them at ease. Put them to bed, mm. you know, and and go out and kill some predators. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you you said it, so maybe we could end with this, man. The herd and the vaccine, because we always talk about the herd immunity. Yeah, you know, do you do you foresee any coercive measures being taken by 
uh, big pharma or the government to to mandate these vaccines? I'll tell you, I'm not uh, I'm not a total anti-vaxxer because I know some of those vaccines. My wife's done the research on them. Some of those vaccines are safe, and and she'll she's got it down to okay. The, these are the vaccines you can have at these times, mm. and and then you know, and this one probably don't, mm. you know, or wait till the sure. child's five or six. Right, right. You know, I'm and mandatory vaccines. I'm an adult. I have free agency, and I know what's best for me. There it is. It's your move, government. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I heard one guy, one of the speakers over here, say that mandating a vaccine was a declaration of war on the American people. Well, well, how do you feel about that type of statement? The government likes to mandate things. Very few people comply. Mm. In the end, yeah, you know, yeah. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a mandatory 60 mile an hour speed limit coming out of here, <laughs> and uh, you know, and that depends on the engineering of the road and this and that and the other thing yeah. and blah blah. And well, that's wonderful that you should mandate that. Yeah. We'll you'll still have your choice. Yeah. The government may decide that they need to mandate something. I like but that. You have your choice. I like it's it. Backed up by two A. So in the end, that's where it comes to. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks, Lee Joe. Let's let's keep let's let's uh, let's circle back on this, man. You know, it's, uh, I'm not. I agree with you. You know, the sunshine likes to get people out, and, and you know, everybody's ha you know, sunshine patriots. I think that's how, yeah. how it goes. You know, with a with a government paycheck. Oh, that that's the sunshine right now. Yeah. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh, when it starts snowing again, actually, and see if I can still make it out into the park and get people to, to come out here with me and have these uh, lucid conversations. Man. Lucid. <laughs> cool. Thanks, All Lee right. Joe. Let's shake hands here. Make it official, man. I appreciate it. <laughs>